From memory, can you describe the front door of your house? When you think about the door, can you actually see it? You might ask, what do you mean by see? That's a tough question, which is why for so long no one has realized there is a fundamental difference in how people visualize or conceptualize things. There are, however, at least a few ways we can tease out some differences. First, can you describe your door? The shape, the color, the texture? A person who can describe it, compared to a person who cannot, may not have to do with visualization, but rather memory, right? Okay, how about we get a little more scientific? A recent neuroscience study showed that when told to imagine a bright light, some people's pupils would constrict and others would not, indicating that some people were able to visually imagine and others not. Does that definitively prove that some people see pictures in their mind and others don't? What if some people just have a hard time focusing or following instructions? All right, here's another way. Do you read fiction? Just that alone says something, right? But let's go further. Have you ever read a book, then watched the movie, and the characters clearly didn't look like you imagined? I'm not talking about Harry Potter, where clearly, on the cover of the book, it shows Harry with his lightning scar between his eyes. And then for some reason, in the movies, they put it off-center. That's just obviously wrong. I'm talking about imagining a character a specific way, and then when you see the movie, you're like, that's not them. The idea of aphantasia is very recent. There are still many unknowns, but things seem to be pointing at a spectrum of visualization, ranging from visualizing with shape, color, and texture, to visualizing nothing at all. This may sound crazy, but for me, for example, I could not tell you the color, texture, or even the shape of the front door of where I'm living. It's not that I haven't gone outside in a long time. I've had COVID five or six times, if that's any indication of how much I go outside. Just kidding. I do like it inside, actually, but I did seriously somehow get almost every variant. Anyway, aphantasia is the complete absence of visualization. I stumbled into it a year ago. I'm not sure how the Google algorithm knew to suggest it to me. I certainly hadn't talked about it. I guess the neural networks have already noticed a trend in what the small, roughly 5% of the population with aphantasia watch. What was odd was that I only clicked on the video because I thought it was about aphasia, which is not being able to speak and is usually the result of a stroke. I saw the thumbnail and wondered why a person who looked young had suffered a stroke. In the video, they said 3-5% to of people don't see mental images in their head. I was like, what? People see pictures in their head? I turned to my wife and asked her to close her eyes and visualize an apple. Do you see it? Yes, of course. No, but do you see it? Like the shape, the color, and the texture? Yes, it's red and yellow, and an almost waxy texture. The light is reflecting off it. What do you see? Nothing, it's just black. Wait, what? What can you picture? Nothing, unless I'm dreaming. What about memories? I mean, I remember details of things, but I don't see anything. So without a picture, you'd forget what someone looks like. I would recognize them if I saw them again, but yeah, I couldn't visualize what they looked like. That's scary. I wasn't scared I was missing out. I was scared for another reason. I was scared because I took neuroscience in undergrad and in medical school. And working in a clinic, I saw a patient who had a sports concussion and after weeks still had problems balancing and wasn't even aware they were struggling. A pit formed in my stomach as I thought about all the concussions I've had. I raced dirt bikes, wrestled, and I found myself intentionally upside down with a board strapped to my feet over snow and water on many occasions, not all of which were successful. Luckily, I'm not in the double digits for concussions, but it's not that I'm not getting close. Had all that recklessness finally caught up with me? I panicked a little, but luckily I found some forums for people with aphantasia. And since I love research and doing surveys, I started asking people whether they had ever had a concussion, and everyone said no. I felt better, but still don't ever rule out anything completely. It wasn't just a survey that calmed my fears about the possible irreversible damage I had self-inflicted. I know my visualization circuits in my brain couldn't be completely broken, because I still have vivid dreams. There was another perplexing question that arose, that being, why, apart from the prospect of irreparable central nervous system damage, did it not bother me that other people could visualize in pictures and I couldn't? It was then that the question arose, what if, because of personality preferences, I just don't value visualization as a tool for conceptualization compared to other tools like schematics, formulas, concept maps, words, symbols, shapes, and narratives? For me, I like to see things as a formula or a concept map. For example, I couldn't tell you what color the front door is, but I could tell you the implications of the features it has and the door that was there before and key memories associated with both. Realizing this, I decided to do a survey to look for a correlation. 
To identify personal preferences, I use the system of seven attributes or ideals I discovered several years ago. Through research that I've done on earliest memories over the last several years, I've identified some common themes. I made a survey which asked people to consider their three oldest memories and select themes that are present. So that the results of this survey make a little more sense, I'll explain a little bit about each of the seven attributes. Here are the seven attributes. The first attribute is initiation. It's charisma or confidence. The second is deconstruction. It's intelligence or insight. The third is expansion. It's creativity or well-roundedness. The fourth is unification. It's kindness or sociability. The fifth is application. It's hard work or reliability. The sixth is preservation. It's organization or preparation. The seventh is transformation. It's wisdom or character. These attributes represent intentions or actions aimed at ideals and correlate with emotions. Each ideal is not ideal by itself, but only if all seven are maximized or integrated. These actions have an order to them, and that order repeats. The cycle starts with the first step, which is the initiation of an action, followed by a reflection, exploration, incorporation, implementation, reinforcement, and finally a conclusion of the best overall direction to go. There is more about this in other videos. It made sense that each of these steps would have a different utility for visualization in the form of pictures, but the results still shocked me. I did a survey on Reddit and Facebook with a small sample size of people from aphantasia groups, asking about their level of visualization, their earliest memory themes, and which personality quality they most identified with. The results, which are in my last video, were quite interesting, and so I decided to do a bigger follow-up survey. Using Reddit and Facebook from groups about aphantasia and hyperphantasia and a subreddit called Sample Size, I was able to get over 300 participants. I focused on the connection between aphantasia, hyperphantasia, and early memory themes, and left out the part of the earlier survey about the personality traits that someone identified with. Asking someone about what personality traits they identify with can have a lot of bias because how we see ourselves and how we describe ourselves to others can change with our mood or our current situation. I figured using memory themes from a personality theory no one has heard of would likely decrease the amount of bias because people wouldn't have any preconception about what answer I wanted them to answer. There are always those people who will say what people want them to say, or just say the opposite just to be contrary. After compiling the data, there were some trends that were quite strong. I was surprised by how much predictive power early memory themes seemed to have, not only for predicting where someone was on the Fantasia spectrum, but also whether or not they had ADHD, and if so, what subtype. Between sharing the results on the first survey and making this video, I've gotten quite a bit of positive feedback on YouTube comments, Reddit, and direct messages. I realize how I present the personality theory and the results of my survey might not immediately resonate with everyone, but I hope the theory I propose and its implications with aphantasia and hyperphantasia at least pique your interest enough to look further into it and test it for yourself. I will be publishing my findings in a more formal way in the future, but in short, what I found was people who reported having hyperphantasia were roughly four times more likely to have initiation themes in their earliest memories and three times more likely to have transformation themes. Less notably, they were 20% more likely to have application themes in their earliest memories. In contrast, those who reported having aphantasia were two and a half times more likely to have deconstruction as a theme in their earliest memories. The expansion approach themes were higher in both those with aphantasia and hyperphantasia compared with the rest of the participants. There are four possible themes for each approach or emotion, two that are abstract and two that are concrete. Those with aphantasia reported having the abstract subthemes in their earliest memories, and those with hyperphantasia reported having the concrete subthemes. The personality theory is still in development, and so the current names I have in the diagram will likely change. What I'm most confident in are the seven general approaches to life in the top. The qualities underneath will likely change. However, the idea that there are four subcategories beneath each one I feel fairly confident in. The early memory themes are based on themes I've found correlated with the seven approaches, and then split up by whether they are concrete or abstract rather than connected with the traits they are potentially correlated with. I have more about both the seven general approaches and the four aspects in other videos. These results are in contrast to the numerous surveys and interviews I've done which showed an even distribution of each of the personality preferences. This data isn't too surprising, however, because there is a theoretical coherence which supports it. This theoretical coherence surrounds the difference in the value of visualizing between each of the seven attributes. Each attribute is correlated to an intention or goal. These intentions are sequential steps towards an integrated action. As we dive a little deeper into the nature of each step or intention, it will be pretty clear the role visualization would take. Initiation is the first step. As with anything in life, there has to be a starting point. 
It doesn't always have to be a giant leap of faith into the unknown, but it will at least carry some uncertainty and require speculation and confidence. The confidence to take that first step comes from visualizing what you think will work, using that picture to aim at. Deconstruction is the second step. Before the first step of initiating, there isn't any hard data. After taking that first step, however, there is. You just have to sort through it. You have the limited picture of what you wanted to do and the limited picture of what you think actually happened. How do you know what the most accurate picture is? You have to break it down, pixel by pixel. Compare and try to verify. Visualizing at this level doesn't look like anything recognizable of what it is. For example, what is this a picture of? It doesn't resemble anything, right? Red 143, green 68, and blue 88 doesn't say much about what this picture is, but it says a heck of a lot about what color that pixel is. Not only that, but that data is reproducible. You could plug it into your computer and get the same color. Well, if both monitors are color calibrated the same, and the composition of rods and cones in your eyes are the same. And, okay, well, anyway, you get the point. It is much more accurate than just calling it pink or red. Deconstruction dissects down to the most accurate variables. Because of this, the results of deconstruction would not be a picture, but something akin to a line of computer code describing where a pixel is and what color it is. The next step is expansion, which takes the variables identified in the second step and looks at them in a wider perspective. For example, expansion would ask, what is everything in the world that is red 143, green 68, and blue 88? Similar to deconstruction, this step is not a static picture either. If anything, it is a mind map with how each thing is tangentially related. Expansion is not just trying to group things into categories, but seeing how many different ways things can be grouped. It's not just a mind map, but a mind map of mind maps. The fourth step is unification, which is bringing everything you figured out in the first three steps together in a harmonious way. It is a Frankenstein at best, and changing rapidly. If it were anything, it would be a Venn diagram of compatibilities. These compatibilities could be represented by pictures. That wouldn't be a stretch to suggest but it also could be conceptualized as a narrative or something more intuitive. The fifth step is application. It is solidifying a plan and putting it in action. This step is when you put your head down and work. When associated with deconstruction, it amplifies that action because it schedules what processes need to be done. And if your personality preference suggests that what needs to be done is more deconstructing, then you'll keep deconstructing until you get down to subatomic particles, first principles, string theory, or midichlorians. The sixth step is preservation. It looks at what is or could undermine the plan and prepares against it. Similar to the fourth step, unification, this step could utilize pictures. It makes protocols of how to respond to each current or future obstacle. And so it makes sense that each protocol could have a picture or series of pictures associated with it. With pictures, present or not, however, it probably looks more like instructions or checklists, though. In the survey, this personality preference was evenly preferred or not preferred in people with aphantasia. The last step is transformation, which is looking at the process as a whole. It looks at what was initiated, deconstructed, expanded, unified, applied, and then preserved to see whether the intention and outcome are effective and efficient. With that information, it looks at whether the cost and benefit are worth it. Initiation was a picture of the first best step. Transformation is the picture of the best overall direction. It is looking for a conclusive or complete picture. The seventh step is a consolidation into a conclusion that will restart the cycle with the initiation of the next step. Our personality preferences typically value three of the seven ideals more than the rest and spends a disproportionate amount of attention on them. This means as we cycle through the seven steps, we somewhat skip over some of the steps sometimes. If the steps you tend to skip or gloss over the most are the two steps that have the strongest utility for picture type visualizations, it would make sense that you wouldn't see them. It would be a logical conclusion to think that you could convince yourself to value picture-like visualizations so that you could start utilizing them. But ironically, the tools you would use likely wouldn't include pictures. Those tools would be in the form of or nested inside schematics, mind maps, Venn diagrams, or protocols. It would be like using a flashlight to look for darkness. Not saying it isn't possible, but it would be difficult. Of course, this is all mostly theoretical, but the results of the survey were quite validating. What was also validating was when I posted the preliminary results on the Aphantasia forum page. A person with Aphantasia, who has been a medical researcher for 10 years, commented that she felt it was a large leap in logic to assume that people with Aphantasia have a personality preference for deconstruction. The irony of her claim was not lost on others in the forum who saw her deconstruction of my claim 
and my subsequent deconstruction of her deconstruction. I appreciate that she has the same research and deconstruction preference and the same alarm for possible inconsistencies that goes off when unsubstantiated leaps in logic are made. I do also appreciate how much further my study would have to go in order to be more conclusive. I hope this video is one step in that direction and that other people will see value in help furthering the research. If my guess is right that people with aphantasia like deconstructing things and doing research, then it shouldn't be too hard to assemble a team. The next step for me in research is to do interviews as more of a case study approach to further understanding the relationship between aphantasia and personality. There's a survey in the description below with the option at the end to sign up for an interview for the study. Finding out that aphantasia existed and that I had it was a relief. I'm excited for all the future research in the area of the Fantasia spectrum because I think it will help us understand ourselves and others better. I'm glad you joined me today, and I hope this in some way helped. I hope to see you again.